Good evening. Happy Tuesday evening. The idea of story living is a little bit different than the idea of storytelling. Uh, the idea of story living is something that informs your every step and something that's informed by your every step. So I just got out of one of my favorite places on earth here, the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library. And I, and I, and I love to talk about this place because you know, the next thing that I'll say is that it actually exists. I mean, that's, it's a funny thing. You've got this metaphysical library. <laughs> but the, but the, the stories that live in all of these books, the stories that exist, and whenever you look in someone's purposeful writing, and it, and it has that little inkling of why you would spend five years or dedicate your life to writing something about an idea. And so um, story living is a little bit of story listening. Um, a, a lot of, uh, uh, of story being and, and a fair bit of storytelling, but it's really about what lives in between. And so the idea of leadership, which is part of the frame here, leadership comes from the old English, ledere. Uh, ledere actually means conduit. So leader is not some person that leads the way and by golly, I'm going to be the person out front. A leader, really, in the, in the deepest form, is someone that is a conduit, a conduit to possibility, a conduit to transformation, and a conduit to uh, a new way of being. And that's something that we could very much benefit from in these changing times. Um, so um, as a lovely introduction, my name is Jay Golden. And really, I have spent my life in search of insight, in search of whether that meant traveling through the world in my 20s to South America and North Africa and Australia and Asia, or traveling through uh, the early internet space in San Francisco, where new ideas were being developed and new possibilities were emerging. Uh, but I, after about 12 years of exploring things in the, in the early internet world. Uh, I had, uh, along with my beautiful wife who's in the back here, uh, we had uh, a daughter. And that daughter, uh, her name is Sophia, and I had a moment in holding this tiny little being in the greatest quiet of what I had ever experienced. Somehow we had a son, but somehow it wasn't quiet. With this young being, everything was so quiet in this moment. And it, and it caused me to reflect on my journeys and my journeys through the jobs that I had had in the 12 years previously in exploring how uh, online learning could work in this very connected space in studying and in exploring animation and storytelling through different media that in a way was very, very exciting, but in a way I had left something behind by the side of the road. And that thing that I realized I had left behind by the side of the road was what I discovered through my travels. And I remembered one particular moment in my travels and I was sitting in a small restaurant in a tiny town in Colombia. In a, in, it, was, it was in the jungle, at the edge of the jungle, and I was in a conversation with a, uh, a young man from Japan. And neither of us, I didn't speak Japanese, and he didn't speak any English at all. And so we're in this conversation across this table as the rain was pouring down on the corrugated metal roof. It was just pouring. We had nowhere we could go. And we both spoke Spanish. And so we were speaking across the table and across these cultures in a language that both of us barely understood and probably had very funny accents in our own languages, but that we could somehow connect across this table and share stories of our lives. And as I had gone through my own experience and all the different technologies that had developed, there was nothing that compared to that traveler's commerce. That com component of connection across culture and across lines that enables us to understand each other. And so I personally went analog. I went 
I, I, I took off all of the techno technological bounds and started helping people to find and tell stories. And that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years. And so when it comes to the idea of navigating purpose, uh, you'll hear me deconstruct some words throughout this experience. The word purpose comes from the French proposé. Anybody? Intent. So purpose is actually much more aligned with intent than it is with something that you feel like you have to do. It's about where you're going. Purpose is about where you're going. And this is very important. It's the first principle of story living is understanding that purpose has to do with a place that you're going. So the kanji, the Japanese, the Chinese symbols in a Japanese language, the kanji for hope. In this time where we contemplate, where are we going? In this time where we contemplate, what does it look like? What, what is the dream that we're aiming for? The kanji for hope is actually two symbols, right? One of the symbols is a wish. But the second symbol is set far away. So hope, hope is a wish set far away. Hope is a wish set far away. Hope is not as well used in my perspective as a verb. It's a noun. It's a place of intent, a place out there on the horizon that you yearn to be, that you yearn to be. And so as we consider this idea of navigating intent, this idea of how to place ourselves in this question, of what story are you living? What story are you living? That's the question for today. So as I'd like you to consider, what story are you living? And where does that story take you? Where could it take you? To what wish set far away? Anybody recognize this person right here? <laughs> That's Nikolai Krzyzewski. Nikolai Krzyzewski was the uh, Romanian leader who was one of the last great communist strongmen. And he was holding the people of Romania into this vision of what he believed the future could be, what his intent was, which was to create an enclosed and strong populace. And he would speak with his wife right there. They would speak in front of millions of people in the main square in the capital of Romania. And Krzyzewski had this great idea. He, he thought to inspire the people of Romania, he would bring in one particular television show from the West. And this would create the inspiration to recognize how powerful his ways are, that he would get that support continued that he so desperately needed. Anybody guess what that one television show was in the, in the early 1980s? Dallas. Dallas. Oh, yeah. Dallas. Now, you might not all remember Dallas. Dallas was the most famous, most viewed television show in the world in the 1980s. And Krzyzewski thought that if he showed this television show, that his people would realize how terrible, how terrible the West is. And that they would come, continue to stay in the fold. But what happened was, Leo already knows the story, so. <laughs> I've told it to him before. <laughs> What happened was people began to look at their lives, waiting in lines for cars for 10 years they would wait, waiting on lines for food, living in these cement buildings, these big block, Eastern block structures. And they would watch this television show, they would wait. Every week they would wait for this television show to come on 
and they'd look at J.R. Ewing and his big cowboy hat and his big cars and his fast moving ladies and the whole story and they would say, I want that in my life. I want that in my life. And it's documented, there's a movie called Hotel Dallas, it's documented um, from multiple angles that Dallas actually created a wedge in the culture and a wedge in the view of communism that sparked, in part, sparked the revolution. And those millions of people that, would, that were in that square in Bucharest, they suddenly one day started booing Nikolai and his wife. Unheard of, unheard of. Everybody, cheer. And this one day, it all turned. And that the way that it's documented is that part of the wedge was Dallas. And in fact, Larry Hagman, who was the star of Dallas, who played J.R. Ewing with the big cowboy hat, and you know, who shot at J.R., the most famous television show in the history of the world at that time. Larry Hagman was walking down, down the street in, in Bucharest, Romania, and people would come up to him and say, thank you, J.R. Ewing, for saving Romania, one after another. And the reason is because it drove a wedge through the dream. And it created a new dream. And so if you go to Romania, you will not see a statue of Nikolai Krzyzewski and his wife in that main square. But what you will find is a near exact replica of J.R. Ewing's house, <laughs> which you could have a retreat center there. You can have a wedding. Um, it's called the Hotel Dallas. So the idea of instilling a dream, the idea of instilling a dream that's, that's set in the hearts and minds of people delivered through story is, of course, an ancient practice. But it's one that is, is planted every single day. And it's not just these great, great stories. It's the stories that happen within us. Now, there's a, another bit to this, which is something that happened in the late 1960s. There's a, a tribe in, in the uh, Amazonian jungle in Ecuador and Peru um, that's called the Ashwar people. And the Ashwar people uh, are a dreaming people, which means that they receive their dream at their initiation when they're in their early teens. Uh, they actively dream every night and they discuss their dreams and they wake up in the morning, drink their tea and discuss their dreams. And from these dreams, they decide where to proceed. Now, in the late 60s, there, was, uh, there were a series of dreams that were coming up that were terrible, terrible dreams that were happening among the people, among the Ashwar and dreams of blackness bubbling up from the, from the waters, and dreams of trees burning down. And they, being the last known tribe to come out and be recognized by the people of the West and the people of the North, they finally came out. And they had to call out to have a meeting with, as they said, the people of the North. And when they did, I actually have spoken with one of the people that was at that meeting. And when they did, and they had a conversation back and forth, the, 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 the chieftain of the tribe looked at the visitors, at these Western, these Northern visitors, and said, you're dreaming the wrong dream. You're dreaming the wrong dream. You have to change the dream. The thing is that, we look at Nikolai Krzyzewski's dream, his dream of a great, strong republic that was held, that everyone would acknowledge his power. And then we look at the dream that was illuminated through Dallas, and we see these different dreams. But the dream, I'll tell you, that's the most important to me is the dreams that we each have, the dreams that we each carry, those dreams that are carried through our perceptions through our perceptions of the world, and they inform how we see the world. And the other thing that actually informs how we see the world is story. So dreams and story play side by side in informing our perceptions, and they're informed every single day. This is my dream. 
That's my little dog. And it's not a dream of uh, South Fork with the biggest house that I could possibly have. Uh, and it's not one that involves just our family behind a great picket fence. But we all have different dreams and we all have different ways that we get there. Um, what was that? I said the Enso. So this is the Enso. And it's kind of like carrying a little bit of a Japanese theme today. But part of what, I, what it's inspiring to me about this is that it represents a circle, but it's not quite a circle either. It represents a circle, but it's a circle with a different ending. And it brings up another story for me. And the story, I don't know what you all were up to in uh, May of 2020. Anybody remember May of 2020? Yeah. Some good feelings? Any, any, give me a one thing that was going on for you personally in your life in May of 2020. Shut down. A lot of gardening. Building a chicken coop. Yep. Intentional community. Intentional, intentional stepping deeper, dreaming up, being in. Yeah, being in your intentional community. Walk in the mountains every single day with our kids. So I was uh, on March 13th, 2020. I was uh, about as far away as you could get. I was giving a, my biggest keynote speech uh, of my life in front of uh, 500 people, the last speaker. And it was very exciting. I was walking to this event. In, I was in Adelaide, Australia. And I was walking to this event, and all of a sudden, my phone was just going on and going on, buzzing and buzzing. I'm, my son's calling, Dad, do you know that they closed the NBA? I was like, shut, close the NBA? Like, how do you close the NBA? You sure you got that right? <laughs> Next phone call, Dad, do you know that Trump just shut down Europe? Shut down Europe? Like, what, how, how do you close, shut down a country? <laughs> These are the things that were happening. So that was a pretty fun day. You can imagine as I was walking onto that stage to get up and looking at all these people with like catatonic and trying to talk about story. But the, the idea of what was happening during that time as we were all entering what Joseph Campbell calls the innermost cave. All of us as a society, we all entered more than any time in the previous tens of thousands of years, the entire world stopped. And that, that's a time that we're going to remember and that our ancestors are going to remember. They're going to look at it in different ways. But one thing that's going to be really hard to overlook is that all of us stopped. And I personally, um, I personally stopped my business. We got, I got back home, thankfully, but did everything short of kiss the ground um, because it very much could have been me, you know, just getting out of Australia now. Um, but the, and we went and, and we walked with the kids, did our best to stay grounded, hung out with our good friends, a lot of times outside. And about two months later, I finally was like, okay, I, I, I have to start my business again. Like, it, 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 it's, you got to, I have to do something. I wasn't super motivated to get on with everybody and do all the online courses and everything, but I had to get it started. And what, um, what happened was I, I just, I felt like I was in quicksand. The alert, the alert of, uh, the, what happens when you, you get that sound from the universe that just like, I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I didn't, nothing I was working on could, seemed like it could move. And that's after I had worked so hard for eight years to get to this place of it having a thriving business where I was in purpose, where I was delivering transformation to leaders all around the world, and then it just stopped. And then when I tried to get it going, nothing would happen. And I said, I can't believe it. I'm in that same place as I was eight years ago, where nothing was happening, where I was trying to write my first book, where I was trying to get my ideas together. 
it, it was tragic. For two days after that, I kind of walked around in circles, just like I didn't know what to do. If I didn't have a chance or an opportunity to help to support my family through my purpose, I didn't know what to do. And then I realized something, and it was an important insight. It's one I want to share with you today, and um, it's, 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 a, it's a key thing to consider. Um, what I realized is that the sun is traveling at 500,000 miles per hour. It's a good metaphysical library topic. The sun is moving at 500,000 miles per hour. So this idea that I was back in the exact same place that I had been eight years before, before I had written my book, before I had traveled around, before I had coached and led all of these movement leaders, all of these CEOs, all of these people around the world, the idea that I was in that exact same place was absolutely physically patently false. And I did the math. I did the quick math on that, right? I said, OK, so if I'm not in the same exact place and the sun is moving at 500,000 miles per hour, where, like, how far away am I? Any guesses? Four billion miles. I was four billion miles from that time in 2012. And with that, enough motion happened with me, enough shift that I was able to get back to work, get able to get out of that lockdown. Because there's something very powerful about a circle, about coming back to exactly where you were. But it's there's one slight difference. You're exactly where you were. It's exactly the same, except for everything's different. That's the only difference. It's like everything, everything's the same. Everything, except for everything. So that's the voyage of the electric slinky. And the idea that we are traveling not in a circle, but in a spiral. In a spiral, traveling behind the sun, moving along. So when I felt like, oh my gosh, I'm right there again, but I was actually there and I wanted to get there, the idea that we're traveling longitudinally getting a shift gives us an opportunity to recognize that all of those moments in our lives where we look up and say, wait, have I been here before? Is this the same thing that I did before? Is this the same place either being stuck or being inspired or being connected? And it gives us an opportunity to take that and actually make a story. To take that and make a story. Because if it's exactly back to the same place, whether you're traveling in the challenge or traveling in the inspiration, we're missing something that is very essential about life, which is the voyage of the electric slinky. <laughs> Steve Jobs said, you can't connect the dots going forward. You can only connect the dots going backward. And you have to have faith in something, religion, spirit, your own capacities. So the idea of connecting the dots, that's the essence of what a story is. In fact, it's also the essence of creating an idea. Because the word idea comes from Idean, E-I-D-E-I-N, uh, the root word, which actually means pattern. So connecting the dots in your own life gives you the opportunity to look for a new insight. And this is really what, this is kind of the center of my work. So I work with a lot of different CEOs, a lot of different nonprofit leaders, entrepreneurs, um, people that are in transition to help them find stories in their lives and restore them, to retell them, whether that means on the big stage in front of 10,000 people or on the tiniest stage in front of two people or in their own lives or sometimes the most important stage, which is for your kids and your grandkids, to find a new star, to find a new moment in your life that remaps your story. So I work a lot of times with people whose stories have been told, like one person I worked with had told her story on NPR and the New York Times and on CNN and people really loved her story. And she comes to me and she says, 
I'm so tired of this story. It feels so worn out. And people, every time, I know exactly when they're going to go, wow, no way, I can't believe it. But to her, it was cardboard. And so the constellation equation is the idea that time travel is possible. And that the most essential thing in your life, the most essential thing in your life doesn't always make sense. And so it doesn't always fit into your current story. And so what we do is we leave it behind. And it doesn't become a part of our greater story. Now, what I mean by the word story is really important to get clear on terms. When I say the word story, I don't mean the thing you say. I don't mean that your message. I don't mean the thing we talk about. What I mean by a story is a journey of transformation. A problem approached in an interesting way that makes us care. But it has to involve change. If there's no change, then it's not a story. So when people say, oh, that's just your story, you're, you know, slow. That's not a story. That's an idea. A story is you were once slow and you've looked at that and now you're less slow. That is a story because that has change in it. And that's the center. We're going to talk a little bit as we go about framing stories. But the key about this idea of constellation equa equation is I want to take you on a journey right now. And I want you to consider, I want you to consider an important moment in your life where an insight happened where an insight happened and it informed your purpose. It informed your intent on your journey. The first one you think about is the, is the best one. Okay? Anybody not have a moment in their life? Now, as you go back into this moment, I want you to recreate the scene. Use the senses to recreate the scene of this place. What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you feel with your hands? Now, if you can't remember these things, you can place a wall. You can place the sand again. You can use your own capacity to restate and replace these elements. But as you go and wander into this place and you feel yourself in that space, give me one sensory detail that you're experiencing. Go ahead, just popcorn style. Just dark. dark. <coughs> Humidity. Humidity. Wet earth smell. Wet earth smell. Touch. Touch. What kind of touch? What's the touch? Um, bodies touching. Bodies touching. Excellent. Excellent. Mm -hmm. So the sensory, so the, the memory experts those people that can actually recite the Declaration of Independence backwards, you know, the, these, these great memory experts that create memory palaces in the mind. The main thing they say is in order to remember a certain instance, you need to have two or three sensory details, not just one. This is one of the biggest things that I find when you're anchoring memory, when your goal is to depict something transformational, you have to bring the audience to that place. And bring audience to that place doesn't mean there I was with someone. I was there with someone. No, it means I was there skin to skin with the scent of lavender and the sound of the waves outside the window. Now all of a sudden we have a movie in our mind and I can't tell you how many expert communicators skip over that part? They want to go through it and they feel like they're supposed to go quick. And then if you stop, then it's getting too personal or it's too vulnerable or it's stopping the story. But the opposite is actually true. When you anchor in the senses, two or three senses. Now, you can't do this in a story 10 times. If you do this in a story 10 times, we're going to be looking at our watches. And we're going to be wondering what's happening for dinner. And we're going to wonder if you're ever going to let us go. But if you do it two or three times 
in two or three moments in a key story, then we go with you from place to place. And then we zoom across time, and then we land in a place. And then it's for you to decide what to show us. So I believe in time travel. And the kind of time travel, back to the voyage of the cosmic slinky, is I believe we can go back in time to these essential moments and we can look around again and see what's there. And when we do that, we might just discover that there was a little star, a little spark that was really important to that story. But it, doesn't, it didn't make sense then. And I'll give you an example. So I've got a client that I work with who's a dear friend and her name is Julie. And Julie runs a nonprofit. It's a national nonprofit helping kids to dream. And they have programs, they're for fifth graders, and they have programs in schools in Orange County and in Watts and in Harlem and in Arizona, all around the country. And it's grown just out of that one school in Irvine, which is nearby where I grew up. So I was working with Julie, and she. I like to start early with my story. So when I work with people, I like to start really early. I like to explore who your parents were. I like to explore what life was like when you were younger. So with Julie, it was one particular story. And she just kind of passed by. She said, oh, I, don't, I remember something when I was 10, but it wasn't that big a deal. It was kind of weird. Um, you know, it was like the hot cement, and I kind of had this insight. And I was like, well, what's the insight? Hold on. I said, oh, it's nothing. It was no big deal. Well, I, I stopped her and we talked about it. She said, well, I, I was walking in the hot cement. I was 10 years old, coming back from the swimming pool, walking home for lunch. And all of a sudden, the heat in my feet, I'm sure there's a book in this library about this phenomenon. The heat in my feet stopped me. And all of a sudden, I was 90 years old on my deathbed, looking back on my life and considering the beautiful work that had happened in this life. Wow. At 10 years old. <laughs> 10 years old. Now, keep in mind, this is not, we're not talking about Ashland. Like, Ashland's got a certain, you know, way of <laughs> seeing things and is a different, this is like a different America and a person who's beautiful, wonderful heart, very powerful, but this was not in her language. And so I was like, well, hold on a second. Wait, what are, you're telling me that you had this vision of your life. Well, what happened in that life? And she said, I was very proud of all that work. Now, remember what Julie's work is. Julie works with 10-year-olds all across the country to dream and to be connected. The group is called Team Kids to be connected to each other and to what's possible. They do all kinds of benefits. They work with police and firefighters. They work to get kids visioning about what's possible. And so when she looks at it now and she says, hey, I think I'm on my way. On my way to that place where I can look back at my life with that sense of grace. So I believe in time travel. The idea of an exam in life, the idea that this rich landscape of our lived experience holds so much important information, but it's not just information, right? This idea like the data, we're so overwhelmed. We once thought that if we can get the data, everything will be solved. And now we're so overwhelmed with the data. It's so much data that we don't know what to do with it. The information is a distillation, a, a connection of the data. It's what begins to give meaning, but we're so overwhelmed with the information. And it's the knowledge that gives context to the information. But it's that top part that I'm most interested in. And it's my, that top part that I believe is the untapped well of potency for our humanity. That in this time of artificial intelligence in this time where so much separation 
is happening in this time where things are moving so quickly, I believe that the true opportunity for purpose, that true opportunity to navigate your own intent, your own special original intent, comes from re-examining your lived experience, time traveling back into these places and seeing what did you leave by the side of the road. Because you might have left it by the side of the road, just like Julie, that moment because you didn't know why it fit. And so you didn't know why it fit, so you didn't add to your greater story you're living because you didn't know how. But I believe that those gems are laying there for us. And that if we go through and examine again the adventures, the twists and the turns, the connections, the possibilities, and we use story as a connection mechanism to bring things together as a device to hold memory, to hold wisdom, that powerful things are unlocked. A new constellation appears. And a new type of purpose emerges. So this is a little bit of a sketch of the, how the, the planets travel behind the sun. The largest one, anybody know what the largest one is? The largest one is Saturn. Again, we're in the right place. Um, the largest one is Saturn. And I've become fascinated by this idea of how we not only chart our course through the universe on planet Earth and how we use it as a model to gather all of our lives. And I think I brought my essential prop. I'm sorry, this is a, not the distraction I was looking for. But I think that the, um, you know, it's like a guy, when a guy becomes obsessed with something, you know, it's like you can't really stop it. I've, I'm a guy now who carries around a slinky. And the, the idea of the cosmic slinky is that your entire life, I'm sorry, we got some elders here. Your entire life <laughs> is held here on this slinky. Everything, every person that you met, every experience that you had, every transformation, everything that you witness lives right here. That to me, is fascinating. Wh where do we keep these things? Where do we, do we are, do they live on our, on our phones? Do they live in our photos? You know, I've got 6,000 photos on my phone. Is that where my lived experience is? It's not. There's some good stuff there, but that's not where it lives. It lives in the cosmic slinky. So the, the, the seasons of story, There's so much data in all of our stories. There's so much data in these great journeys that we have to have a way to partition it. It's, that's the only way that we can remember is if we separate, we make some kind of a mechanism so that we can store these experiences. I'm back, I'm back now I'm really back in the skin on skin and the lavender and the waves outside. These are experiences of our lives, and we have to have ways to store them. Now, our ancestors, they knew how to do it, right? That's why all of the great books are only story. They're all story, parable, message, insight. So traveling through the universe here, we take a segment. And that one segment depicts one season. Summer, fall, here we are, we're about right here now. Fall, winter, winter right there. And just the possibility, the mere possibility, and this is where all great stories live. This is the one thing I would like you to take away from this experience tonight. The one thing, if it's just one, all great stories live right in between that place 
between winter and spring. Just between that, are we going to survive and all possibility is alive? Just in between that place. Kurt Vonnegut, great American writer, said, someone gets in trouble and then they get out of it. People love that story. They can't get enough of it. We're addicted to it. It's the science. It's the science of story. So a little tidbit. Um, this is the journey curve. The journey curve is a distillation of the hero's journey, of Kurt Vonnegut's shape of stories, of Pixar's frame for storytelling, of improvisational storytelling, a little bit of Joseph Campbell peppered in. <coughs> and the three main things in this story have to do with the then one day, the until finally, and the ever since then. If you hear a then one day, that's where there's change. If you hear a then one day, if you hear it until finally, then we have change. That's the difference right here. This is what Joseph Campbell called the innermost cave. Remember, the seasons of story, summer. This is the first leaf that falls. This is fall, the depth of winter the place of not knowing, the place of not knowing. I can't tell you how many people I've worked with that are terrified to depict the not knowing. And that is the most essential part of the story, the winter, the not knowing. Now, it doesn't have to last 10 years, right? Sometimes it does. I'm in one of those right now. Sometimes it does, but it doesn't have to. Sometimes it's five seconds. But you don't want to skip the not knowing. That is the place of winter. And then here, this tiny little line, that tiny little line that leads us to that until finally, that is where all the power is right there. Because from that not knowing place, that exploration into the not knowing, that depth of the cave, you're searching for possibility. Like I was wandering in circles in May of 2020, wandering in circles. What? Oh my gosh, I can't believe I'm back there again. But there was one thing. Sometimes it's something that somebody tells you. Sometimes it's something you remember from five years ago. Sometimes it's a random bit of information that you pick up from one of these juicy books here in the metaphysical library. But it's that one thing that brings you that first sprout that first sprout. So for me, do you remember what the insight was that got me out of my struggle in May of 2020? The fact that the sun travels 500,000 miles an hour. Boom, boom, just enough, just a little bit. But that did the job. Boom, we're in spring. That first little sprout. Spring is not the everything's rosy spring in the ancient way, in the ancient way of all peoples, is that we're going to be able to make it through this season. And that's where all prayer, where all books, where all great texts come from, is that we as a people, we as individuals can make our way through the deepest moment. And we're so connected with ourselves, with one another, with the earth, with possibility that we make it through to spring. <clears throat> then one day, because of that, because of that, because of that, innermost cave. Until finally. Thank you. Until finally. Because of that, and because of that, and ever since then. Now, the ever since then, really, you're, you're, you're through the story when you get to the until finally. But you're just not quite done. The wind is at your back, but it's the ever since then that is able to give it true context. Now, I happen to have discovered in my house a few journey curve posters. 
just in case anybody wants one. I'm going to put them right here for later. But you can, I know that it's better to have, I just thought that was kind of fun. I was like, hey, I've got some posters. <laughs> so um, I've used this story frame. Um, I know it's built on a lot of wise people um, and their, their knowledge. Um, I've used this story frame for a lot of different things. At the essence, my favorite kind of story uh, is a travel story. Now, a travel story can take a lot of different forms. A travel story could be a TED Talk or a keynote. It could be a book. Uh, it could be a little insight that opens up your speech or your story or your social media post. Or it could be something that helps you, as, as it's helped me, to get through some of the greatest challenges uh, of my life, which is uh, contextualizing my own journeys so that I can make my way through, um, but also contextualizing things to my children. So you take this, whether it's a nephew or a grandkid or a, somebody you're working with, and you look at a moment and you say, a moment that's really important, and you, you, you think, where does that moment live? Does that moment live on the, the until finally? Like, is that moment that I remember, is it really the until finally bit? Or is it the ever since then? Or was it really more like the beginning of the story? And then you look, and you go do some time travel. You get quiet, and you reconstruct those moments. You, re you, you put some walls back up. You add the sounds of the ocean, and... The scent of lavender again. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm on that one. The, and, and, and you reconstruct through the senses that experience. And then you go looking around again. And you say, wait a second, what is that story? What is that story really? And why does it matter today? Now, I do a certain thing that's called the five whys. And the five whys, really fun. When you're feeling like you want to tell a story, whether it's one of the many stories, one of the big stories, you ask yourself, why does that story matter? Why does that story matter? But you don't just do it once. You do it twice. No, seriously. Why does that story matter? Why is that calling me right now? Why did that appear when I was driving? Why does it, what difference does it make? And then you're like, oh, three times. I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding around here. Why does that story matter? Now, you might think three is enough, and sometimes it is, but I usually go to the next one. And I say, I'm not joking. This is real. Why does that story matter? And usually by the fifth time, I'm so tired of this exercise that it becomes clear. Because there could be a few different answers to why the story matters. And it's always in context, and it's in context to this moment right now. Right? Because really, when we're telling a story, there's two main things that are important. One is, where am I? What's going on for me? What's happening? What matters right now? And the other one is, where are they? What ma I did it. I tapped my chest. Um, <laughs> what, 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 where are they? Where are they? What matters for them? What do they care about? What do they know? What do they think they know? Where are they from? What just happened today? Because if you're walking into a room and you're about to tell a story to a group of people, you can't just, A, forget about what happened today, especially if something important happened. But you can't dwell on it either because you've got a job to do. So where am I and where are they? And your job in telling a story is to match the two, to bring the two into a journey. Now, there's your tiny little stories, the small little stories. This is one of the things, I'm going to come back to this, but I really recommend uh, that everyone consider uh, gathering those little stories of, of every day. Uh, my wife and I, we have uh, our probably the most precious thing that we own um, that didn't make it in our car when we were evacuated for that uh, little brush fire a month ago or so. Um, 
that we, we, we did our, it was a test run. We knew it was kind of a test run, but it, even a test run, you got to get in the car and you get the dog and get the dog food and get the crying daughter and get the, you know, you get in the car and you drive and you stop to tap, knock door, knock on the elder's door down the street, but you get in that car and you get out of there. Um, we didn't take our journals. And that's something we're, we're going to have to work out. Um, but the, but, but we're both very avid journalers. And one thing that I really suggest as a practice is that when those little things happen every day, those little ideas, those little bits, those funny little things, those strange little things, those little things that just kind of like, they want to just hook onto your belt, you make a tiny little note of them. Maybe it's in a journal. Maybe it's in your, uh, in your phone. Make a list. Because the thing is, you don't, as a... I mean, again, I work with a lot of speakers, right? So it's their job to do the story of living. It's their job to convey new insights. They, if they don't do that, if they don't serve as guides to their audiences, they're not doing their work. And so it's a, it can be a little bit different, but you, how many people are working on writings right now? Raise your hand. How many people make media? Raise your hand. Make media? Um, <laughs> Uh, how many people uh, are, make film? I guess that's a media question. So all of this matters because you're in the practice of gathering those little insights. Now, you're not going to know. This is the key. You're not going to know the importance of that little insight until a week or a month later. That's why it's valuable to just make it. It doesn't have to be a long jotting note, but it's... So those small little stories, I believe, are really important. And from a story living perspective, coming back to the Ashwar people, whether it's something that comes in a dream, or it's something that happens, some moment of serendipity, or trial, or struggle, those little small stories become part of how, what informs our path. And so charting them, resourcing them, what I do with my clients, sometimes I say, hey, you've got to get up in front of an audience of your team members, well, how do you prepare for that? What do you do, right? Because what you, people usually do is they just get up, you know, or they spend five minutes thinking, but they don't consider and source this life material that's out in front of us. And that informs um, how those big stories go, and that informs one of the most important pieces when it comes to changing the dream, which is our shared stories. It's not history. It's not her story, it's our story. It's how stories come together to inform a greater story, and that is the thing of culture. And putting those stories together, that's part of the work, but if you know the story you're living by understanding your constellation and understanding what new insights have informed your greater story, then you more readily recognize those around us and you recognize who, who's on your story and who you can work with and who you can co-develop with. And I know Ingrid and I recently, we like, we've lined up on a big story. And we felt, we're like, whoa, OK. Well, this is a really important inquiry um, about these lands, about how to live into a new dream. What are the component parts of living into a dr new dream? I'm not making an, a Dallas TV show. I'm not trying to create the next South Fork mini mansion that lives in Romania. But there are stories that we create every day that, in, that when they come together, they inform something greater. Um, I want to talk a little bit about some, um, some fun stories of people that I've worked with uh, that, uh, that create stories every day to give examples of what story living leadership looks like. Um, this is my friend Deborah. Deborah uh, was in a, a story experience legend that I created in Orange County uh, last year. And when she and I first began talking, she told a story. She said, you know, I've got this important story and, I, and I'm not quite sure um, what to do with it, but I need to tell it. And so she said, my story begins with a cello on my back and a suitcase in my hand. And you can see that's, that's, that's how she entered her story there. Um, her story also, it's kind of a theme tonight, her story also was uh, when she was 10. 
She had the cello on her back uh, because when her mother was 10 years old and lived in the northern part of Chicago, she wasn't allowed to play an instrument. It was a, it was, her school was desegregated, but they did not have the resources to get an instrument, and there was no possibility to, to get one. And so her mother, when she was 10, her mother's name is Ayola, and her mother, when she was 10 years old, she had a dream, and she decided, when my kids are born, they're going to have instruments, and they're going to play music. So she held out and waited 20 years. And her kids, she had seven kids, and every one of them played an instrument. And the sound of music flowing through of all kinds of diversity of jazz, classical, and concerts, and all so much beautiful music that was flowing through her home. And so Deborah's telling the story, and she says, and I have a suit. That's why I have a cello on my back. And I have a suitcase in my hand uh, because I lived in a house that was very violent because my father was very violent. And my mother, when she was finally the, the third child had gone off to college on a musical scholarship, she started planning how we were going to leave. And that's Deborah's, that's Deborah's story. And Deborah's story um, is about how they got on a train that very night when she was 10 years old, and how they traveled to Denver, and how they traveled to San Diego, and how she says she has a very spiritual family, but it was so hard living in these shelters that she said she couldn't even pray. She could only play. And then in the story, it's so awesome. She sits down and plays a cello. Oh, so good. Bless you. And so the what, what happens in her story is that one day her mother comes to her and she's got this job working, helping these kids in the school. And she says, you have to come and play in front of these kids because these kids in this town on the other side of the tracks, you know, she thought she was coming to Oceanside, like, you know, coconuts falling from the trees. This is the other Oceanside. This is where the Bloods and the Crips are. This is the other Oceanside. And she's like, these kids, they've never seen musical instruments. They've never heard anybody play. You have to come. And she's like, I'm 10. Like, what do you mean? But she did. And she showed up and she played and she tells the story. And she played. And, and as she played, she had an insight. She watched those kids and how they opened up. And from that dream, from Iola's dream, was born Deborah's dream. And Deborah, if you fast forward 20 years, Deborah now runs a school that has taught 30,000 children to play musical instruments. And it's running, it's running to this day. And they create, pr create programs, and they create concerts, and they create theater, and they create sound of music, and all kinds of different shows. But that was all born from Iola's dream. So Deborah, uh, this week, I. I Part of the fun part of my job, I have to admit, is that every once in a while I'll get a random text, and in that random text would be a video. And this happened to me twice this week. And one of the videos was something that I worked with Deborah on to take that 12 minute story that was so rich that everybody in the audience was crying. It was so deep. And she's such a potent storyteller into a 30 minute story. So then she was able to stretch out and drop into more about what was happening for her mother when she had that first vision, what it was like for her. She was able to drop deeper into her own experience at age 10. She was able to take us through the journey and depict with more detail what it was like when she first set out to start her first camp. Right when she was, she had her first camp, and she said, "I'm gonna." She was teaching music, and she set out to, to, to do a camp and 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 teach other kids, not just in the school district that had enough resources. And only three kids signed up, and she said, "What am I doing?" And she went to talk to her husband, and she's like, "What am I doing? This is like, I, maybe I'll do it when I retire. It's not gonna work right now." And her husband looked at her and said, "If you don't do that now, you're never gonna do it." And that was the spark because she doesn't like anybody telling her that she's not going to be able to do something. <laughs> but she was able to tell the whole story of her organization in 30 minutes. 
um, at a Chamber of Commerce experience where she played the cello. And so I'm just randomly, we're tuning in for Saturday Night Live, one of our favorite uh, cultural experiences here in the Rogue Valley, because we, we get it live. And, and I get this video of this 27-minute story. So that's Deborah. So again, this idea of story living, right? It's not just a story that you tell. And it's very essential that you're doing the listening. It's the story listening, because if you're not doing the story listening, looking for that new star that might appear, traveling back in time and considering what was maybe an insight that you missed, that you didn't think was important, like Julie standing on the hot cement and suddenly having a vision looking back at her life when she was 90 years old, but she was only 10. This idea that these moments that are so important, but we don't know how to contextualize them. And it's okay. It's understandable because we were working in a certain shifting paradigm of the time. But we can go back there, discover those insights, bring them into today, and create a new constellation and meet others that are working on a constellation too. This is Charles. Just a couple of stories. This is Charles. Now, when I met Charles, um, I was introduced to him through someone uh, actually who was somebody I was working with in Boise, which was a place that I lived when I was a kid for five years with my family. And, and Charles is from Irvine, which is the place where I lived um, after Boise with my family. And so I started talking to Charles, and he needed some help, and he was... He, run, he runs a roofing company in, in Irvine, and he was wanting to talk about maybe being a better storyteller. And I have to really be honest with you, I had no idea what Charles was talking about. Uh, and I'll tell him this, and I have told him this. He has so many things. He would hop from this thing to that thing, and he's talking about this idea and Habitat for Humanity and the Ronald McDonald House, and we could put roofs on there, and what if we work in the culture of our, of our people, and we could every, hop around. And I, and I told him, I don't know if I can be helpful um, because I couldn't track what he was talking about. But with another conversation, what I realized is that Charles was talking about the same eight things over and over again. And what I realized is that he wasn't just talking about these things. He was actively working on these eight things. And there's one story that I want to tell you about Charles that will help to inform this. When Charles was just early in his business, and money was tight, and he was trying to make the mortgage, he got a phone call from a woman who needed a new roof. And she needed a new roof, and he thought, well, this is great, because I need to make my mortgage. And if I can get there, you know, and I can, I can make my mortgage, then we're back in good times, and it's all good. And so he drove out to meet this woman, and he drove past a nice neighborhood, and the neighborhood got a little more sparse and a little more sparse, and a lot more sparse into a place where there was a house that was set back and a flat roof that was clearly leaking and no grass and cracked windows. And he, as he approached the house, he knew that he was in trouble because he was not going to make his mortgage from this house because he could tell like they, this was not something that they could afford. And he opens, and he wanted to go, and he wanted to leave because he's like, what am I doing? I'm driving all the way out into some place, and what am I doing? I can't stay here. But he went, and you know, he's obliged, and he knocks on the door. And as the woman opens the door, he smells mold so strong that he, his knees buckled. And he says, what? What am I doing? It's, it's part of his internal self is saying, i got to get out of here. Like, what, what, how am I doing this? And just then, a young girl comes along, grabs his finger, pulls him along in the house in a very narrow hallway. And she's really happy because she wants to show him something. And what she does, she takes him. And, and in this room, she shows him this My Little Pony poster that she's so proud of. And, and she's glowing and smiling. And on the floor, 
are two mattresses with mold on them. And the crack in the roof is so distinct that he can see the drips. And everything again in his body is saying, I can't do this. I have to go. And something in him tells him when this woman comes and looks at him, she says, can you help us? And something <laughs> tells him and compels him to say, I'm going to try to help you. Now, he doesn't know what to do because he knows they can't afford it. And he can't even ask. But what he does is he calls some friends. In fact, these friends are kind of frenemies. They're people that are in the same industry that usually they're in competition. But he calls a few friends and says, I'm going to show up. I'm going to try to get materials. Will you kick in and collaborate and show up on Saturday and help to put on a new roof? And by the end of Saturday, that flat roofed house had a new roof on it. Now, that's a story in itself, but if you fast forward 30 years, which is how long Charles has been in business, they've now put roofs on all of the Habitat for Humanity houses in Orange County, all of the Ronald McDonald houses across the country. They donate roofs multiple times a year, and they find ways to do it. And the, what Charles says is that what he's discovered is the art of fearless giving. And what that does is it becomes, his business becomes an engine, an engine for purpose, an engine for good. And those eight things that Charles was talking to me about, it's a pure visionary, a person that sometimes is hard to track, are still the same things that he's talking about eight years later, talking about supporting Habitat for Humanity, Ronald McDonald House, having blood drives in their building, doing love drops in the lockdown in 2020, supporting the Boys and Girls Club, all of the causes that he most deeply believes in. And that's what compels his business. And that's also what makes today Charles Antis the storyteller of Orange County. So that's my buddy Charles. That's Julie, who I already told you about. Um, and I told you about her story about when she was 10. Uh, but this is also a story that she got on stage and told at our show, which is called Legend, um, about uh, having brain surgery and how scared she was running a business, a national nonprofit, um, and how scared she was when she came out of brain surgery because she didn't know how to communicate what was happening. She was dizzy. She felt like she was going to fall off the stage. She felt like she couldn't really see that well. Uh, and it was a very, very hard story for her to tell. Um, but it was harder for her to not tell it. And that's kind of the role of vulnerability, right? Like, I know that vulnerability is a big thing in the world of story. And the people say, you got to get vulnerable. I'm not a just get vulnerable kind of person. Um, that's, you, you need to do that sometimes. But from a story perspective, it's actually bringing vulnerability into that innermost cave, holding in that place of not knowing and letting empathy surround you as you move to the next part of your story. And that's what Julie did. Um, the idea of a metaphor, <coughs> a metaphor comes from uh, the word metapharine, the Greek word metapharine, which means to carry across. So I'm a big fan of metaphor. I oftentimes pretty, pretty rigorous with establishing metaphor. I believe that you can tell a story that delivers on a metaphor, but then you can use that metaphor for different purposes. Um, and that's a whole study in itself, but it's one of the principles of story living. Um, I was sitting with, we were sitting with our, our son uh, recently who's, who's starting his second year of college, and he was telling about how he was going, uh, 
going with a buddy of his, and the buddy says, let's go make some dad lore. And I said, well, hold on a second, stop the press. He's like, what do you mean dad lore? What's dad lore? And he says, oh, you know dad lore. It's when you go out and have a great experience that you're going to tell your kids about. And I was like, immediately, you can tell me what some of the dad lore is from my life? And he says, yeah, dad, like hitchhiking across Argentina like you did. And, you know, and hitchhiking on a sailboat like you did. And, and it was so interesting because it's not until we talk to the people around us that we know sometimes the stories that we're living. Right? We think we know what those stories are, but it's not until we talk to our kids or our friends or our parents or the people we work with and we learn their stories that we understand about the life that we're living. I'm going to let this story stand as an ancient mode of story that sometimes we don't know how we're sharing stories is not exactly in the same way that we're sharing stories today but those stories continue um, the hippocampus back to a little bit of brain science the hippocampus this small seahorse shaped mechanism in our brain is required for filing our stories. It's connected to spatial orientation and it links short-term and long-term memory. This is why the practice of recent relevant moments, that journaling practice, is important because it keeps our hippocampus in shape. It keeps us flexible with our memory, leveraging these expressions and able to connect and store with more acuity. Um, a little bit of a suggestion, you could take one of these journey curves and on the back of it you could create your own legend. Legend again coming from the Italian word leggere, to read. The legend is not some grand story that's told about you, the legend is something that depicts how you read the map of life. And just by simply drawing, here, can you guess who this is? It says Moldy Mattress there. That's Charles's legend that we created together. The idea that you just draw a line straight across the middle, and you start here at zero, and you go there to your age. And you break it up by 10-year segments, and you chart the good moments, the positive moments, and the challenging moments. And you just chart them as moments. Again, moments lived in time. They might be eras or experiences or times that you also can depict. But by choosing a moment and charting your legend, you might be really surprised if you go back to this legend, not just once, but every week for four weeks. And you add a little bit. You take it to the cafe. You think, oh, what was that moment there? And what happens is those moments aren't necessarily stories, right? But if you remember that winter into spring, that journey curve model, what a, a legend depicts stories by choosing one moment connected to another moment connected to another moment. And that's how you start to formulate your bigger stories. So I've got some blank legend maps for you here on the back of the journey curve. Um, that's our experience for today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, on that one, it, so right there between about 22 and up leaning on 37, does that say fog zone? Yes, it does. So, can you, a little bit of, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a gap. Yeah, uh, well, this is a pretty personal um, thing for, uh, for my friend. Uh -huh. um, but we all have our times for various reasons that we don't uh, particularly remember yeah. or um, a, or we're not particularly able to presence. Okay. So that's the particular awesome. experience here. Yeah. Um, but, you know, it's, it's depicting um, how do we, uh, I think this was, a, this was a religious gap 
a, a, a religious journey in his life that he doesn't quite reference in the same way that he did back then. Um, but the point, the overarching point is you spend an hour creating your legend, marking those difficult moments and those great moments. And you, you put some soundtrack on, and then again, you put it down. And then you come back to it again in a week or in a few days. And you add to it again. And you because you're not gonna remember this entire this entire life of all of these experiences that you've I'm sorry, that all of these experiences that you've had. It's not, you're not going to remember them, and they're not really designed to re be remembered, right? It's, this is the art of how the hippocampus works. We file these short-term into long-term memories, and part of the opportunity in creating your list of recent relevant moments is that it activates that hippocampus again, so you're going to be thinking not only about the things that happened yesterday, but you're going to be thinking anew about those things that happened 30 years ago. And you can go back to those things again and look around and see what your life is trying to tell you. I don't think you really covered it, but um, it seems to me that your seasonality in story, do you, do you see a gendered form in storytelling? Like, is there feminine and masculine storytelling? Like, do I tell a story that sucks somebody into it and is in a receiver mode or in the opposite in a very masculine way penetrates their story and takes over Do there's, there's kind of like a like a like a power play in storytelling so you're talking about living your story right but to do it at an individual level would be all internal so if we're communicating externally we're telling a story externally that's going to sweep every people around us either bringing them into our story or giving them an opportunity to incorporate us into their story, right? Okay. So there is a polarity to how we tell stories, right? We are kind of communicating our stories in a way of, please lead me in telling me what to do or how I incorporate into you. Okay. Or in the opposite, which is, I'm going to parent you and tell you how the story is in enveloping you, right? Like, is that kind of um, how I might interpret it from a personal accountability standpoint? Well, big topic. Um, let me, let's, let's say one thing here. When I think about the feminine masculine in story, um, coming back to uh, this territory, um, I consider the cave to be the feminine. So the place of going into the place of winter, the place of roots down in the ground, the place of not knowing, um, that's the place that is the, that's the sacred feminine from my perspective. This place coming into spring is the kind of rising up. So I, I view it as um, a delicate combination because we're talking about all of the seasons. And so the delicate combination is, yeah, you're, you're going outward or projecting outward. Uh, but if your story only projects outward, you're going to be missing something. And I only ask you because you titled this seminar Leadership in Storytelling, right? So I'm just, I'm just trying to piggyback on your title, right? So I look at this, and what I look at is I'm surrounded by a bunch of people who really are just kind of feeling sorry for themselves. And so like, if I'm gonna participate, I'm either gonna have to feel sorrier for myself to either be with them, or I'm gonna take a leadership role. So I look at this and I'm like, okay, I'm being told a story and really it's just kind of like, uh, I'm the victim. So where do I find the question that says, until finally for them? So now I start telling them some questions that kind of tricks them into doing this for themselves but without me telling them that that's what I'm doing. But that's kind of like a, like a toxic mother kind of thing where it's like, I'm not going to let you learn from your mistake. I'm just going to kind of encapsulate you in a story that's going to make it work out either way, right? I might see that as my leadership role, but I'm not their parent. So I'm just trying to distinguish between where I'm actually authentically showing up as a leader to an invitation of somebody asking me for help, 
or just creating a barrier so that I'm not feeling sorry for myself participating with other people's stories. Like, I'm just, just so I can navigate this very confusing story, confusing story, confusing storytelling world, I'm looking for some tools kind of like the, the question you said, which was, why does this story matter to me? Like, that's like a good tool for me to keep myself in the mm -hmm. present moment mm -hmm. outside of my story. Yeah. But still in, use the power of the story. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a big study. Yeah. Um, I think that I'll come back to the, the way that I define leadership using the old English um, word ledere, which is what leader comes from. The leader is not some person that tells you what to do. Mm -hmm. not, the, not the way that I use it. That's, that's not the kind of people I work with. <laughs> um, it's not the kind of per person I aspire to be. Um, ledere means conduit. Mm -hmm. So conduit is being a channel mm -hmm. to a different way of being. And the various tools that you have or capacities, if you want to take the, uh, come back to the plant, like how do you, how do, how do we serve as a channel to support life? Mm. How do we serve as a channel to support interconnectivity? How do we serve, serve as a channel so that people that have leaky roofs but not enough money to pay can actually have a healthy way of living? How do we serve as a channel or a conduit for these thousands of kids that unless Deborah came along and catalyzed, became the conduit for music, they would never pick up an instrument. So that's the, that's the context. And the, the how is a, is a much greater contemplation. But that, that's what I'll, I'll put out into the equation there. Yeah. I really love that definition of leadership. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't know that it came from the root word conduit, basically. And it reminds me of um, Peter Block's most recent book, Confronting Our Freedom, mm -hmm. where he talks about how leadership is not about changing someone else's behavior. Mm -hmm. Leadership is confronting others with their freedom, mm -hmm. whatever that is mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. how freedom and accountability are the same thing. Mm -hmm. In order to be accountable, we must be free to make our own choices and yeah. mm -hmm. show up in our own way. And in order to be free, we need to be accountable to ourselves and right. what we really want and not be placing the responsibility on the people around us for what we have or don't have, those sorts of things. How can we show up mm -hmm. in our full, true, authentic selves, mm -hmm. recognizing also mm -hmm. um, Viktor Frankl, the last human freedom, is our ability to choose our attitude in any situation. Mm -hmm. So it's very existential. And it's this opening up of leadership as a conduit to each of our own inner narratives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the gap between that, that infinite gap, mm -hmm. kind of coming back to the bridge of metaphor between stimulus and response. Mm -hmm. That place between I am triggered and how do I respond, or I have experienced this, and how do I interpret, or I am taking in this data, and how do I translate it into my life? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You in the back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you in the back. <laughs> <laughs> That's my wife. Yeah. <laughs> We're there. We're always Respond, children. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I, I'm compelled to respond to that because it's so true. Kind of um, bringing yourself down to connect with someone else who's struggling, or that that somehow, um, what do I want to say? I guess I just want to say that when you dig into your life in this sort of framework and find stories that can be sort of authentic in your overcoming something that you've overcome in your life, mm -hmm. that. By sharing what you have been through in a way that is real and, and not about you necessarily. It's what you've been through, but it's in service to the person listening. Mm -hmm. That then they can see themselves in you and they can see what is possible for their lives from your courage. Mm -hmm. so, so that you're not trying to tell someone a story to get them to do something. 
And I, and I ask this just from personal experiences. Like it seems to be my work in yeah. this world, right? Yeah. It's just it's like I'm supposed to like build this bridge between the real masculine and the feminine because mm. no one has a clue. But where we're going with this is absolutely. Mm -hmm. But people are very good at talking about vulnerability. What they're very not good at is being vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so I can speak a story in a very neutral way that cuts to the core. Mm -hmm. And because it's so close to the core, someone's just going to think it's personal. So mm -hmm. I, I'm trying to see where, instead of trying to do so much extra work mm -hmm. to avoid offending people, mm -hmm. I just embrace it. And I'm like, hey, guess what? Mm -hmm. We're already going to get offended. So like, until finally, but I, mm -hmm. I'm just seeing kind of what, what you're saying, or is it the seasonality? There's a very masculine feminine polarity. So if you can identify where the polarities you're starting with, half of the volatility is just always meeting the audience with the wrong polarity. So if they're already in the receiver mode, the storytelling or the way of communication connecting needs to be a bit more masculine. And if they're already masculine, invert, and they need to be more feminine. So I'm just, I'm just trying to how to regulate. Mm. I think that part of the trick is um, there's, <coughs> there's a sensual dance with delivering a story that people are not always ready to receive. Mm -hmm. And so the, you know, that happens a lot in the business world where, I mean, I worked in That's done with, a with, lot, so. with companies where people are like, I, we don't have time, right. we don't have time to hear a story. You know, they don't have time to hear a story. That's, I've heard that so many times. I would argue they don't have time to not hear the story. <laughs> because, why? Because if you're so afraid of telling them a story, story is as much about leveraging memorability and brain science to impact memorability as it is about creating transformation. So the, the, the brain science of kind of you know, of, of the dopamine, right? The dopamine that is released when you're sparking curiosity and curiosity that enhances retention. When you're curious, you're open, right? But it, people don't just, oftentimes, they're not just curious. You have to spark them by setting them on a journey. So there's the dopamine. And then there's the cortisol. The cortisol is what focuses our attention. It what, it's what makes us pay attention. Hey, danger. Now, you can say, I'm not in danger. I'm just sitting in this room. I'm not, you know, I'm not getting on a train running from my violent father, right? But in the field that's created by leveraging the sensory detail and dropping people with dopamine into a place of cortisol, part of your brain is like, am I safe? And when you're saying, when your hormones are popping like that, then you're, and you're wondering if you're safe, that's when you're going to remember that's leveraging the senses. Now, if you stay there too long, that's where PTSD comes in. That's where people are like, can, I, can we go now? Because that's too much for me. So it's a delicate balance, right? That's where we come into the oxytocin. That's where we come into the connection hormone. And, then, and that's the dance, is how do you create or illuminate real stress that you've experienced that real winter, will we survive? How will we survive? What kind of prayer or cultivation or walking or preparation will be required to make it through to winter? And by the way, it's not just one story. This, the great myths and the stories that resonate are, they resonate because they're stories of all of ours. Mm -hmm. And so that's part of the, part of the study. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or questions? Please. Well, I don't mean just to diminish, but like the simplicity of this function that is very human is to remind us that there is a seasonality to life. Mm -hmm. That spring does always come, that winter does all, you know, and I think that's beautiful because that's why we, that's the kind of reminder we need when we feel like we're going to be somewhere forever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Which comes back to the the Enzo, which comes back to this, the, you know, it's 13 o'clock. The idea that it's not just a circle. Mm -hmm. it's cir it has circular components to it, but with some longitude, it actually looks like a circle from one angle. You know, this looks a lot like a circle mm -hmm. from that angle, 
but it's different. And I do think that this is kind of, I think that story is like the human rings of the tree. Like story is what helps us through the seasons, not just the seasons that ma are matched by, you know, an average of 91 days, but rather the seasons of our lives, which come back to how we hold our experiences through story. Even goes beyond this life, and mm -hmm. this embodiment, right? Connected to something longer and larger. Backwards and forwards, yeah. I'm spending a lot of time with my ancestors lately. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, in both directions, and and the you know, and we we're, we're using seasons, but we're also breaking seasons. Like, what does season mean right now? Like in Florida, what does it mean? So we're in some of these big mythic questions that require us to cultivate new story. And by new story, um, I mean, I only mean an old story with a new twist. I don't mean a brand new story. So Elena, uh, Ingrid mentioned Cam Peter Block, and I am sort of being sent back to when he was asked to really instill creativity in corporate America, because it, mm. it sort of died on the vine back in the 70s or 80s, who he called in was David White, mm -hmm. you know, the poet, mm -hmm. you know, really the storyteller mm -hmm. in, in poetry mm -hmm. to actually kind of spark this, this process, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know to, I don't have time for a story, I certainly don't have time for a poem, right. but, you right. know, there's something inside the um, whole process of words and the magic of, mm -hmm. I mean, to me, David White is brilliant mm -hmm. in setting the, the, the sensory, mm -hmm. the, the sensory information that moves one mm -hmm. into places that, we never dreamed we were missing. To orient from a different place yeah, and right. to connect in a different way. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, it's the same thing that, like, uh, related that, you know, diversity. Um, diversity doesn't just serve to have different kinds of people. It serves to have different kinds of perspective. Yeah. 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 You in the back? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if you could speak to the alchemizing force and power <coughs> of actually telling our stories and being witnessed in the telling that the change that happens within us when we have that sort of holding um you know in terms of changing the dream in terms of of noticing new things about our lives that we didn't know before um mm -hmm. through that through the process you take people into well, I think one thing that I, I'm really studying right now uh, is that those those three people that I that I shared um, their stories, uh, as a result of some of the the group work that I've done in Orange County, um, I put together these pods of these different leaders, and they're all purposeful leaders. They're all working on transform transforming something in in the community. Uh, to teach about storytelling and to get them speaking and acting and communicating and leading in different ways. But what I didn't expect, and this is what's kind of wild about it, is that our course would be done and then they would all keep meeting and they're all meeting, they all have a breakfast club now that I get to show up for whenever I can, <laughs> every like third Friday. Um, and now what they're doing is they're working together with each other and they're sitting on each other's boards and they're working on projects together. And, and I've like, what is that and why is that? And I think that the foundational reason is because authenticity, the idea of authenticity coming from the Greek authentikos, which means genuine or original, authenticity is a rare commodity. And part of the reason is because we've, we've rose up in these kind of square pegs. We've been taught and had to adapt ourselves to be uh, this or that, have this title or that title. Title coming from the original word, which means inscription, right? What you're inscribed in is something deeper. But what I think this idea of sharing in an authentic way, in an ongoing fashion, cultivates trust in a time when trust is at a great deficit. <coughs> because the, you know, coming back to the vulnerability component, not vulnerability for vulnerability's sake, but because there's no other place 
where we can be real. Mm. And that story is a vehicle to carry that. And so one thing that's really fun that I keep musing on, and I was talking to a couple of them today, is that now that's all their best friends. <laughs> Literally, I'm not kidding. They're, they say, besides my family, mm -hmm. these are my people. Mm -hmm. And why? Because they've all been real with each other in an environment that doesn't necessarily cultivate that. And they continue to do it. Some of the things that I hear that are shared in that group, they raise the bar for me. Like I have, I say, well, gosh, I can't hide this from the group because they're all talking in a real way. I have to be real with them to honor the bond. Um, so that's one of the things that comes up when you bring yeah, that. Yeah, great. Um, I think that that's a, that's a culmination. Thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.